Henry Hopkins, a former director of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Fort Worth Art Museum in Texas, the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, professor of art history at UCLA. Now you're retired and you have a new career. You're a painter. <laughs> you were trained as an artist at the Art Institute in Chicago. How does it feel to be back in your first career choice? Well, it, uh, it's very interesting, and, uh, and certainly I am enjoying it, if that's the right word about making art. Uh, when I was in school at the Art Institute, I trained as a, as a painter, uh, then was in, drafted in the service during the Korean War, and uh, was stationed in Germany, and got to see great art in all of its context, in the right process, got very much involved in art history, came back to UCLA, studied art history, then went into museum work, and simply reached a point, though I was painting a little bit at that time, and was in a couple of jury annuals here in Los Angeles that uh, Clement Greenberg judged and things of that kind. But when I got into museum work, I felt I had a double conflict of interest. One, I was supposed to be taking care of other artists, not myself, and number two, you just don't have time to do it. So while I've done some diddling around and drawing, I never took it seriously, but I always said once I left museum work that I would get back to it. So at the age of 70, uh, that occurred, and I said to myself, have you been lying to yourself all of these years, or are you going to do it? And so I said, if you do 25 little paintings in the next year, you believe, I believe, that you will keep doing it. And I did 23, and that was close enough. So I've now had two exhibitions of my little Japanese watercolors. They're very small in scale. But uh, I now have some ideas for a new series, which I'm not going to tell you about, because I'll, it's like writing a book. You don't tell the story while you're producing it. But we'll see, OK? Henry, is, is, was getting back to the painting just like uh, riding a bicycle? You know, you never forget, and you just do it. It's amazing how you don't uh, forget. Uh, it is like riding a bicycle or skiing or any number of things. So those basic things come back. But I did think when I began that I was doing kind of finger exercises, and I was, in fact, working myself back into things. Uh, and uh, I must say honestly that as I got into it, I was, would go back and look at something and say, wow, you know, you you remembered something or something or whatever, you picked up something over the years because uh, uh, my hand was still fairly steady and uh, the color worked right, the composition worked right, and so it was okay. Why do you work mostly in watercolor? Uh, well, that's interesting because uh, uh, when I was younger, I obviously worked in oil. It was before acrylics were even on the market in those days, uh, and sculpture and a variety of things. But I did always draw. So this is kind of an outset of my drawing is really what it amounts to. And then I found these watercolors a few years ago, Japanese watercolors, which come in a big porcelain kind of dish. Uh, and they have a wonderful kind of quality to them because you can use them very transparently, translucently, opaque, in any way you'd like to. Uh, and you can cover up mistakes and you can do other things like that. And it, it just seemed like the right medium for me, so I'm happy with it. Was, was there a point um, before you reached 70 and you started painting again where you, during a show, and you suddenly went mad and said, I want to grab a paint. <laughs> I want to stop paint. You mean like a, a young failed ballerina that goes to the ballet and says, I'm better than any of them? What are they doing up there? <laughs> well, it, uh, it, crosses, it crosses your mind, of course, as you, as you watch art production and you, and you are conscious of it and you're knowledgeable and you have to be knowledgeable about what's, what's going on. Uh, so you, it flits through your mind, how do you fit into that picture, what is, how does that relate? Uh, the nice thing is that when I did go back, I felt that I was in a position where I didn't owe anybody anything. Uh, I didn't have to be part of any ism or school, I didn't have to follow theoretical practice. Uh, I could do exactly what I wanted to do, and I've been able to do that, so that's great. But, I, but yes, I think there are times, clearly, when you uh, during an exhibition or you're looking at a given show and you say, oh God, you know, maybe where is art going? This is not where I think it should go. That's ultimately none of my business, so. <laughs> so. 
If you had a larger studio, would you work lar make larger works? Well, I'm sitting in my studio. That you know, that's exactly all I need. My my paintings are essentially I consider it a big painting if it's eight by ten inches, and I, because I work in rather meticulous detail, uh, and uh, a part of what I've been thinking about is in fact uh, working again in oil or perhaps acrylic, uh, and on a somewhat larger scale, but certainly not giant scale. I it's just not my nature. Where do you get your ideas for paintings? <laughs> Where do I get my ideas for painting? Well, I mean, they're, they're rather surreal. Well, they are rather surreal, and that's always been a school that has been of interest to me, you know, from the, from the beginnings of that, and I steal from them quite liberally in terms of what I do, appropriate, I guess is the right word in this day and age. Uh, but uh, as I began to work, there, there are elements in there that have always been part of uh, what I like to think of myself as being, having a certain sense of humor uh, and appreciating a kind of skill, physical skill and technique, which is not a common thing or not applauded. Uh, but the idea just kind of come out of nowhere. I think when I first went back to painting, uh, I was essentially dealing with flowers. That was purely perverse, you know, who was dealing with, with flowers. That was number one. Number two, uh, because my father was an agronomist and because I grew up respecting plants and flowers and all of the things around it, it was also a, had a positive side to it. But I thought that maybe uh, by using flowers as a uh, disguise symbol, that taking something that is a living object, which we accept now, uh, as, as a plant having a life, as a, or a carrot having a life, or a deer having a life, uh, that using a flower as a symbol of that, uh, and then putting them in jeopardy, you know, in, in being affected by weather, being affected by acid rain, being affected by seasonal things, being affected by being cut uh, as a cut flower, all of the different aspects, that I could use them as a as a symbol. Okay, and that, so that's really where that came from, and then the ideas kind of spread a little further than that, a little further than that, so more recently it's a combination of using art historical references but making comments about the environment. So that I'm, you know, the most recent paintings have had more to do with trees than flowers, but trees in a kind of jeopardy situation, same, same idea. Okay. As a longtime museum director and curator, would you say that you have we'll say, top five favorite exhibitions over the years, and if so, what are they? Well, if I have top five exhibitions over the years, they probably would not be ones that I did. Uh, certainly, there are extraordinary things that, that change your life and change your ideas and your attitudes. Probably the one exhibition that influenced me more than any other was the presentation of the Ahrensburg Collection when I was a student at the Art Institute of Chicago when it was traveling around the country to decide where it was going to house itself, ending up, as you know, at the Philadelphia Museum, and a collection that was built here in Los Angeles. But it was a collection laden with uh, Miro and uh, Picasso and Brock and De Chirico and Cornell and endless uh, that Duchamp, you know, and uh, uh, all of the major modern artists at that time. So when I went to school, it was the era of uh, Ben Sean. And, uh, and the American regionalist, uh, Grant Wood, Thomas Hart Benton, you know, people of that kind. So essentially I thought that's what art was. So when I saw this exhibition, it just totally turned me around. Uh, and uh, what had been favorites became something else and I began to see it in a different way. But that's kind of every art student's evolution, I guess you'd say. But that was a wonderful thing for that to happen. Uh, I think an exhibition that I really adored uh, was when I was in the service actually in Europe and they did an exhibition of Picasso sculpture and I did not know Picasso that much as a sculpture before that time. This was in Paris and it was just so extraordinary the fact that he used cut paper and then translated into metal and into cardboard and into this and into that. Uh, all of those elements uh, are, are part of it. Uh, and I would say probably the generality that without getting into specific exhibitions uh, probably my favorite museum in the world is the, is the National Gallery in London. It has more of the things that I personally uh, find tremendously rewarding. It's not to say it's any better than the Louvre or any better than one thing or another, but just the particular pieces that I 
love are in there. Uh, of the exhibitions that, that I have done uh, over time, uh, probably the ones that loom largest are the Robert Rauschenberg exhibition I did in, in Texas, not the one later in San Francisco, only because it's the first time that Bob had been seen in a retrospective show in Texas, and he was, of course, born in Port Arthur. And I think that he is increasingly, uh, though he's getting very fragile now, but as these decades have gone by, uh, there's always that question about Rauschenberg in relation to John's, Rauschenberg in relation to that, what have you. And most people were picking John's over Rauschenberg, but Rauschenberg has just blown John's away in my mind and his international interests and in dealing with uh, the artists of other countries and his open generosity, which is amazing. So, And I guess I'd have to put in there the Philip Guston show, which to me was a, a, a great, great treat because I had installed his show here in Los Angeles back in about 1964 when it was done by the Guggenheim and then met him later in life and uh, again and uh, did the exhibition in San Francisco and it's, it's has had so much influence on younger artists that, uh, that that's very rewarding. Henry, to continue with the international theme. Mm -hmm. And you, you did some very interesting work in 61 with um, uh, the, the war, uh, war Babies. War Babies. War Babies. Yeah, the war babies <laughs> yes. as well. And that was very deeply political, and it was about isolation. And we're mm -hmm. revisiting that whole issue again about America and isolation mm -hmm. at this point. Yep. Um, would you care to comment about how art, as, uh, as exhibited in, 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 other, in foreign countries globally, um, represents who we are and, and, and how it breaks down the image of not a superpower, but a, a highly creative, artistic mm -hmm. uh, country, how we explain ourselves, and, well, and what are some of your ideas and thoughts of how this should be presented? Well, uh, what are we going to be, four hours here? <laughs> 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 yes. Yet, no, what you're talking about is very much on my, on my mind. Uh, you can't work around young people now uh, and not be conscious of that, and you can't work in a university like the University of California, Los Angeles, where uh, the student body is now, you know, so-called whiteies are minority within the, within the population of the school, so you're in an international community every day you walk on campus as far as that's concerned. So you can't help but think of those things, but uh, to go back to the War Baby show, which was done in 1960 during a brief period when I had a gallery, uh, a group of young artists that were in Chouinard at that time, which was our leading art school here in Los Angeles, uh, and they represented the next generation after what we think of as the Ferris artists, Billy L. Bankston, Craig Kaufman, Ed Moses, Ed Keenholz, that whole group, who were the first generation to kind of stay here in Los Angeles and work throughout their lifetime, or a larger part of it. So it was my idea to pick up this next generation, and Joe Good was the person who made the initial contact with me, but I then met uh, Ed Burrell, and I met uh, Ed Ruscha, and I met Ron Miachero and Larry Bell, uh, all of whom were in the same general class group. Uh, and it was Joe that proposed the title War Babies. Uh, they were all born in 1935, 1936, in that period of time, and just babies during World War II and coming up in this kind of Eisenhower era, uh, pre-hippie, uh, post-beat, I guess you'd say. And uh, uh, so that was the idea, and I said, sure, why, why not? You know, uh, we weren't selling anything at the gallery anyway, so what difference did it make? <laughs> and, and so uh, they contracted or agreed with their close friend, Jerry McMillan, to do a photograph uh, of them. And it was the four of them sitting around a table with an American flag draped over it. And uh, Ed Burrell, who was black, uh, was eating a watermelon, and Ron Miyashiro, who was Asian, was eating with chopsticks, and Larry Bell, who was Jewish, was eating a bagel, and Joe Good, who was Catholic, was uh, eating a mackerel, and they were dropping crumbs on the, the, the flag, and so forth and so on. It's a, it's a great, great photograph. Uh, but we were not even, I think, conscious of the fact that that was a multi-ethnic exhibition. It just, they were just four guys who were making art at that, at that time, uh, and that was not a major, major issue. Uh, when with the poster was made, and it's now a classic, uh, we got hit from the right wing, John Birch Society, which was very strong at that time, uh, who wrote death threats, you know, a number of people writing death threats and things of that kind. How could you do this to the flag? How could you do that? So forth and so on. 
And then we got hit just as hard from the left for using these cliche, cliche images of a black eating watermelon and a, a, and a Jew eating a bagel and what have you. Uh, so it closed the gallery, but that was beside the point. It was uh, it got all these guys started. They're all working well, and they're all making their living as artists, and that's good. I have tried to be conscious of the fact that one's vision has to expand. In this period of time, when we are at least within my world, as far as I'm concerned, we are globalized. You know, I realize a lot of the world resists that, but in my world, thinking of it as a global system, it means that we, with Western eyes, have to see through a different kind of vision. We have to see what has been going on in Thailand for a thousand years, okay, that we think of as kind of folk painting or whatever else it might be, but what does that have to, you know, what does that have to offer? Uh, what's going on in contemporary Africa, and I know there's a lot going on in contemporary Africa. I've not seen much, but I know there's a lot of activity that's highly political, social in the, in the message that it, it presents. Uh, we in the West have become increasingly theoretical and, uh, and conceptual in terms of the, the way we approach things. Uh, New China is laden with uh, young artists who are extraordinary. Uh, my greatest concern is that each of these cultures are becoming increasingly westernized because essentially the West is where the market is. Right? Uh, and because the West is where the market is, uh, if you in fact are living in China and might have a particular aesthetic attitude or philosophical attitude, if you have the opportunity to show in the Venice Biennale or show in the, in the Documenta, let's say, in, in Germany, and therefore have exhibitions after that time. So you have to mix, bridge your art many of them have bridged their art in such a way that it has a Chinese message so we with our Western eyes can say, oh look at this, he's anti-communist, he's this, that, you know, so forth and so on. But also that fits into the Western mode of, of description, whether that's in video, whether it's in film, whether it's in painting, whatever else it might be. So all of these new techniques are spreading across the world. They are presented by us, but it is absolutely clear in my mind that while maybe 30 years from now New York may remain a major mercantile center for art, the creative aspects of art have moved away from New York already a long time ago and to a certain extent here in California, uh, certainly into Asia, certainly all over Asia, which is about Japan or Korea or China, wherever else it might be, uh, and ultimately of course uh, South America, uh, Africa, uh, and uh, so I don't think we're going to be, I don't think we, the United States, uh, are going to be the center of the art world. Now we're going to be the center of the merchandising aspect of that, I think, for a period of time. Uh, but if I'm reading art correctly, then more and more as it's being produced, it has less and less to do with art as a commodity and more to do as a social medium, as a, you know, as a, as a basis of communication. And I think that's where we need to communicate better, okay? And we have to understand the message that's coming back to us better. We have to first of all receive it and then, and then understand it. And I think in the next decades that's what'll happen. Henry, we, we're along the internationalism, the globalization, uh -huh. and you, you mentioned the Venice Biennale, yep. and you one year curated the Venice mm -hmm. Biennale. I did. Yep. How did you decide the artist, the work, Get the criteria on that, if you well, will. Well, okay, that was in 1970, uh, and I was asked to be the commissioner, director of the American Pavilion. Uh, the idea had been already more or less coalesced, as a matter of fact, uh, by the National Collection of, of Fine Arts, uh, and the thought was that we would go to Venice, not show one artist, which has been the tradition, you know, like the British Art Council chooses X and the French Council chooses Y and German Council Z. Uh, and we had in the past through the way we'd handled it. But we decided that we wanted to show the reemergence of printmaking uh, in the United States, which was big at that time. It was the time of uh, Gemini and it was the time of, of all of the new print houses and new techniques. Uh, so selecting the artists out of that was a matter of looking at piles and piles and piles of, of print. And we selected some hundred, including the best known artists in the country, like Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg and Ed Ruscha, everybody that was making prints at that moment, Louise Nevels and so forth and so on. And uh, 
The idea was, because it was in the 70s, therefore the kind of hippie era, that we would set up a workshop where we would have actually make lithographs, actually make etchings, actually make things people could watch these artists in process and ask different artists to come and work in the studio while it was there, which we did. Uh, but it was 1970, it was the year of the student uprisings in Paris, it was the year of all of the stuff going on around the Vietnam War, uh, and because uh, the Venice Biennale has always been thought of as being government sponsored as opposed to Documenta, because each country sends its artists, uh, it was a time for artists to revolt. So many of the artists that we had selected said, no, we don't want to show. And uh, many of them did not, and we had a big sign up on the wall saying, Joe Smith has decided not to show, and Mary Smith has decided not to show, and Jasper Johns has decided to show, and blah, 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 blah so forth and so on. So it was, given, it was given that kind of credibility. Well, it fit into my life pattern in a very amusing and interesting way, because it's kind of war babies too. It's all of these different and disparate people making decisions about their uh, attitudes about art, patriotism, nationalism, all of those things coming into play at the, at the same time. Uh, the highlight is that, uh, that Ed Ruscha came. He didn't want to come, uh, but he felt he owed me something, I'm sure, and he wrote me a note and said his mother said it was all right if he came. <laughs> so, but the idea was for each artist to present uh, one gallery, a room you know, of, of fair size, uh, that would be up for about a two-week period of time, and then another artist would take over another artist. So he did a thing called the Chocolate Room, he was working with organic materials, making his prints at that time, uh, and he bought hundreds of tubes of Nestle's chocolate, okay, and uh, hundreds of sheets of paper, and using an open mesh silk screen with no image on it whatsoever, just simply squeegeed uh, uh, this Nestle's chocolate onto these pieces of paper, and hung them uh, in the gallery wall, totally covering. So it looked like a California bungalow. You know, it looked like a shingled California bungalow. Uh, but you walked into the room in that Venice temperature in the in the middle of June. It was like uh, you you couldn't stand in there for more than three minutes. It was just an overpowering aspect, uh, which he was very amused by, and we were amused by, and it was and it was good. Uh, but then uh, children found out that all they do is lick their finger and rub it on this chocolate and pick up a little chocolate and also leave their initials and names and what have you. And so we very diligently uh, took down those. He left us about 500 extra sheets and put a new one up each day and what have you. But then the ants came in. I was and, going to <laughs> ask whether there wasn't an ant and, problem. And when the ants came in, they, uh, they uh, over a weekend, you know, created a whole different environment than it existed before that time. And it was from that that Ed then, uh, seeing all those ants, did for the next year the document of catalog and cover, which was all about ants, right? So. Everything has its history, that's it. <laughs> right. More exhibitions should be done that represent globalism. This, by this I mean not just exhibitions of American artists, not just, Amer just within our own country, but in fact uh, artists from different countries with different thematics, different ideas, and that those exhibitions should travel internationally. And that's, you know, that's a, a thing that really has not happened. We have documented, we have the Venice Biennale, these big things that happen every four or five years. There's now a Korean Biennale, things of that kind. But they're being selected not from the basis of communication, they're being selected on the basis of, of new processes, learning new processes, new ways to make art and what have you. So if we're going to call it War Babies 4, then in essence we're talking about uh, a an exhibition that has a political, social, humanistic, spiritual message, okay, which can be read and understood by anybody in the in the world, and it would be made of artists from different different origins, okay. Now, that's hideously complex. It's just like it was with uh, the German expressionists, for example, in northern Germany, with Kirchner, who said, "All right." The cities are ugly, they're messed up, they're full of people. I'm going to paint about that. I'm going to paint them in bright, ugly, you know, vitriolic colors. I'm going to talk about how nasty that is. I'm going to talk about man in relationship to nature. I'm going to take my girl out in the woods and we're going to skinny dip and we're going to do beautiful pictures of each other and what have you. Or sitting down, you know, 200 miles away in Munich, uh, Kandinsky and, and Franz Marx saying the world is exactly the same thing that, that Kirchner said it was. But instead of doing that, they said, we're going to take this position of spirituality and, and move toward an art that everybody can understand, which is form, line, color, 
and so forth and so on without political content, but it would be spiritually revealing to anybody in any place in the world. Well, they came from the same roots, they had the same basic idea, but they approached their art in a totally different direction. So I think that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. You talked earlier about Judy Garowitz, now uh -huh. known as Judy Chicago, uh -huh. which reminded me, what has happened, do you think, over the last years uh, that women have become so prominent and successful as artists because they weren't uh, early on, you know? No, there were not. <laughs> there were, uh, as, as various uh, exhibitions about women art have shown, there have been women making art through the ages and some of them really quite extraordinary, uh, but they certainly were never recognized in relationship to their male peers. Uh, just taking a modernist position of that, let's say a post-World War II position of that, uh, the dealers in those days, the major dealers like uh, Sid Janus and, and others, just simply believed that no woman was going to keep making art, that they were going to get married, they're going to have babies, that that was, you know, that they could not, as a dealer, say, all right, I'm going to show this artist because I can't be sure that five years from now she's going to be making art, how can I build a career on that kind of a basis? And, and that and many were rejected. Uh, Others, of course, like uh, Lee Krasner, and, and were you know were married to artists and had a reputation within their little group, but were not shown in the same way because it was a male-dominated, male-dominated world. Okay, uh, here in Los Angeles, in the 1960s, uh, late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, the group around the Ferris Gallery was a pretty macho bunch, you know, and they weren't going to accept a number of artists who were working at that time. I think of Linda Levy. I think of uh, uh, Lily Fenichal, I think of uh, uh, your good friend uh, uh, who does the geometric paintings, who you lived with Marcia her. Huff. Yeah, Marsha Half, for example. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Judy, of course. And Judy was a battler and believed that she should have you know, more representation than, than she had. But, uh, but with that battle, this was the battle of feminism in general, okay, and certainly it, it permeated the art world. And when women convinced everybody else that they were going to keep making art, whatever it was, and as more women became art dealers, as there were more women on museum staffs, for example, a slow evolving process. Uh, but nonetheless, now, I think if you look at the, if you wanted to make a list of the 100 top artists, there would be a significant number of women in that list. And I think that each year that will grow. It just, uh, you know, if you look at the proportion of students in school, it is predominantly women who are, who are in the art schools now as opposed to men. Hmm? Isn't there no line between women art and it, <laughs> male it, art? Is there no is, line? Is, is there, there no, no line? line anymore? I mean, isn't it totally... Oh, there, yeah, there, yes, there's a line, and I, and I think the line is probably drawn by, uh, uh, by collectors, probably more than anybody else, and established by, by dealers. You know, if you... Uh, because it's essentially an aesthetic preference, or if you want to put it that way, if they, I'm not saying, I'm, not, I'm making a definite thing between, say, male and female, but I'm just saying that, that if you uh, are drawn to the art of Jenny Holzer, then you'll probably be drawn to a number of artists around Jenny, many of whom are women, okay? Uh, and there was a, there were women's theories about art, which came out of the traditional women's crafts, like quilting, for example, in history, like the dinner party and other objects that came out of that. Uh, but, uh, but now I would say there are people making sculpture like Nancy Rubens uh, that 90% of the people uninformed in the world would never believe a woman did that. It's just a big, muscular, masculine, tough sculpture, you know, like Richard Serra or something else of that kind. Uh, so those lines have blurred, certainly. And, uh, and I don't think that one necessarily thinks of, of uh, art as being by a woman or by being a man, that you think of it more as being by an artist, unless there's something in that work, like Cindy Sherman, which uses herself, her own physical physiognomy to make those things, make those things uh, function. Uh, but I was very pleased about two months ago to read in the, in the paper and actually go to a little party to find that uh, uh, Judy Chicago's dinner party has been purchased by the Brooklyn Museum and will be on permanent view forever beginning next year and a special gallery being made for it. And uh, so that's one of the great victories of that period of time. As you know, people loved and hated that 
piece as, as such. It was a major controversial piece, but it, it stands as a symbol of the feminist movement for that, for that era. Besides the, the new painting career, uh -huh. you're about to embark on a very interesting project uh, with the Getty, mm -hmm. in association with the Getty Trust, mm -hmm. not the museum, but the Trust. Talk a little about that project, will you? Well, uh, the project is, uh, will start uh, this summer, and it's been funded for a year's time by the Getty Trust through its research division. Uh, to do an in-depth study of Los Angeles art history from the 1950s to the 1980s. Uh, after 1980, I think the Getty feels that it's not yet established enough in history and there will be younger scholars that will come along and do that. Uh, and before the 50s, uh, so much art history has been lost, the question is how much can you recapture because the people are gone. Though I think we'll make every effort to push it back as far as we, we can. Uh, because a lot of things did go on here in the 30s and 40s that were interesting. Uh, the era from the 50s to the 80s essentially represents a transition of Los Angeles from a, uh, a town with little, little culture, except in very specific areas, uh, to a town really which now parallels New York in terms of its, of its creative activity. Uh, not necessarily in terms of the market, but in terms of producing artists and other things like that to attract that history. And while uh, two or three books have been written uh, and two or three exhibitions have been done, uh, most of the information is still apocryphal. You don't know whether this is true or not true, whether this happened or when it happened. You don't know exactly how this transpired or how that transpired. So the purpose is threefold. It's to first of all seek out all of the archives in the greater Los Angeles area, wherever they might be, uh, dealing with the art of that period, catalogs, brochures, mailers, whatever it might be. Uh, either get them into an archive in a real way, or if they are being taken care of in their institution, let's say like the oral history program at UCLA, fine, but catalog them. So, so ultimately it would mean that you could go to the Getty Museum and see a catalog and you'd be able to list everything that was available somewhere in this area being taken care of. Second would be then the artist archives or people in the area who have done things over the years uh, that would become archives that either would go to the Archives of American Art, who's working with us on this project, uh, and the Getty. Uh, so bringing those archives into, into focus. Uh, there's your basis for future research. And then to do, uh, for a year, I think it would take at least that long, a really intensive oral history program but not necessarily individual oral histories, because a lot of those have been done already, but rather group oral history, oral history where you'd bring together as many of the dealers that were here, let's say, in 1960, just make a, an arbitrary year, uh, bring them all together in a room and just make them pinpoint what they did, when they did it, how they did it, how long they were in the business, you know, where they were, how they got there, different things of that kind. And then you can t take all of that information on a big chart and gradually pinpoint each one of those things and, and pin it down. And, you know, because uh, when was it, for example, that, uh, that uh, we had the uh, exhibition here uh, of uh, surrealist art? There, uh, there was a Magritte show, there was a Max Ernst show, there was a Dolly show. There was At the Copley Gallery. Yeah, well, that's it. The, and the, the, the point is, when was the Copley Gallery here? What other exhibitions did he do? Did he actually sell anything out of that, or did he buy it all and take it back and, and eventually sell it at, at major, major prices? There was this person running up and down the coast called Galka Shire selling uh, Kandinsky's for $35, and nobody bought them, you know, and, uh, and uh, so all of those things that, go, that went on here that have never been documented fully or correctly. What's so important about L.A. history? As, as compared to other history, you mean? Well. I think the, the difference is that, uh, well, I just have to give my personal, personal reasoning. Uh, I felt that about 10 years ago, whenever that was, that we had the riots and we had the fires and we had the floods and we had the earthquake, all of that stuff within a very short period of time, a lot of people left Los Angeles. They went off to Oregon, they went off to Washington, they went a lot of different places. Uh, but the people that stayed, I thought, for the first time in my lifetime, really began to think of themselves as Angelinos. They really began to think of this as a place. Sorry. 
Uh, when I came here from somewhere else, you came here from somewhere else, uh, all of us came from somewhere else, but now many of our children have been born here and many of our grandchildren have been, have been born here. So uh, if there is a, a longer leg in terms of, of history going on. Uh, and then thirdly, the, the fact that the community has really changed. It's changed from being a, a stopping ground of people coming from other places. It really has developed in a way that makes it a, a rather remarkable, creative, and cultural community very different than the East Coast. And I think that's the exciting aspect, is the fact that, that it's generally recognized, even on the East Coast, that more young artists are coming out of Southern California right now than anywhere, anywhere else. Yes, New York is still the mercantile center. All right? Yes, uh, New York is Eurocentric. Yes, Los Angeles is, is Asia-centric. So you have these two centers that balance each other, very different from one another. Very much the question I was asked earlier about how do we, even in our own country, do this deal with this bridge and this mix and these things that go on. Uh, but now there's an opportunity to do it, which didn't really exist that much before. So uh, now, and, and of course, I'm very biased. I just, I just feel that Los Angeles has been on a roller coaster ride up and down, up and down, up and down. But I think with the Getty Museum, with MOCA, with other things, stabilization of the County Museum, Norton Simon Museum, uh, in the arts at least, we are, uh, we are a community to be to be reckoned with in, in the world picture, which we weren't before. Well, Henry, I think we've covered your whole life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you certainly covered a, 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 several <laughs> facets of it, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much for talking to us, and My good pleasure. luck in your new career. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.